Good morning. I'm Ray, and I'm one of the teachers at Rankin First Christian Church. And I'm teaching the International Sunday School Lesson Series for the fall quarter. And our fall quarter is entitled Love One Another. And today's lesson for October 25th. May we pause for prayer. God, we thank you that we have an opportunity again to share this with people who who love you and who uh, need, as we all need, your your love and your instructions from your word on a daily basis. Uh, guide me as I uh, go through this lesson, but also guide each person as they listen, that it may enter their hearts and change their lives. In your son, Jesus. Amen. Love Never Fails is the title of day, today's specific lesson. Uh, last, last, this is a third lesson on this, uh, this theme out of the New Testament uh, from the book of Luke. And then here, this lesson from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, one, 1 to 13 is going to be our text today. If you don't have a book and you would like to get your Bible ready and have that uh, as we begin our lesson. 1 Corinthians is written around 56 by Paul from, from the city of Ephesus uh, on his third missionary journey back to the church at Corinth, which he had established on his second missionary journey. And it had been some months there, and he had gotten word of a lot of difficulties and problems that was going on in the church. And it seems that all of these problems that, that they had stem from the, the sin of pride. Uh, they were seemingly a very prosperous church in the city of Corinth because it was a, a metropolitan uh, area. It was sitting on the isthmus and that it was a trade city. So there was a lot of people coming and going and had a lot of commerce. And they were very seemingly very proud of who they were. But this, this ability that God had given them to have the miraculous gifts had seemed to go on to their head and to their heart, and it caused a lot of problems in the church. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul goes through a long list of the spiritual gifts and the difficulties that they were having with the spiritual gifts, and he picks that up again in chapter 14. But smashed between those two chapters, Paul pauses to give us and to give them the answer to all of the problems that was in Corinth or all the problems in our church or the pro all the problems in any person's life. And this is that all things are based on love. And we understand if we've been in the church very long, you've, you've we read the Bible, you understand, we understand that uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter in the Bible. And it's not the emotional, uh, stuff that we talk about in Valentine's Day and that sort of thing. This is the hardcore stuff uh, of what love really is. And so as we look at these uh, 13 lessons this morning, Paul is going to directly look at what is going on in these people's lives with these spiritual gifts. And then he's going to give us basically a formula of how to use what God has given us uh, for for him and for the church as a whole. So let's uh, begin by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. These first three verses, Paul is going to deal with the spiritual gifts. And he begins with one that seems to be a great problem there. Uh, and of course, it has plagued the church throughout these 2,000 centuries. And this thing about the speaking in tongues. If you recall back in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the church began on the Pentecost, those 12 apostles uh, spoke in various uh, languages that day. Because we had people, and, and uh, Luke does record, there were about 13, 14 different countries there that spoke different languages, although they all these Jews might have spoke uh, Hebrew. 
But still, those apostles were given the ability to speak in all those different people's language. It seems also that here in Corinth, there, there were those who had that ability to speak in other languages. Remember, I said that com, uh, Corinth is a commerce, commercial city. A lot of people move through there and a lot of nationalities move through. So these people, God had given the ability to share the truth, uh, share the gospel with these different nationalities without having to learn their language. You know, today, missionaries, we, if we send missionaries to a foreign country. Uh, sometimes they go through language training. We used to make almost everyone go through language training. Uh, but now, since English has become such a national language, many times they go in without any language study and then learn as they go. But in this, in this age, they were given ability to speak in languages. And so Paul says, whether it's the tongues of men or whether it would be an uh, angelic language, he says, without love, he says, those, those words that come out of your mouth is just like empty, empty gong, empty, empty uh, clanging of the drums. They're, they mean nothing uh, because they're not uh, given from the heart of love. And I think we still had, as I've already mentioned, some of these same problems in the church with, with speaking in tongues throughout the ages. As far as God is concerned, without uh, ever the whatever the elegance of our speech, uh, if it's not done in love, it's really meaningless. Verse two, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So in verse two, Paul names a couple of more of the spiritual gifts that the people in Corinth had prophecy. We know that uh, we have the prophets in the Old Testament, but all of their all of those words that we have in all those books, whether it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, one of the minor prophets, was not what we often term to as prophetic or futuristic tellings or what God is going to do in the future. Most of those books deals with those prophets preaching to the people about what they've already been given in, in this, uh, not Sermon on the Mount, but in, in the law. And uh, so they had a lot of scripture already. And so, so much of the prophet's preaching is to trying to draw the people back to God from what they already had. But we also know that there are many futuristic prophecies. And so, Paul is talking about here probably both of these, uh, but since it had become a pride issue, it was probably those a lot of this thing about being able to tell what's going to uh, take place in the future. Now, we don't have any of these writings down for us that those people spoke. Uh, uh, the only one we have anything from there, of course, is Paul, and he does tell us futuristic things. So most of Paul's uh, uh gifts that he had he used to bring people to the gospel now there's something else in here the ability to understand mysteries and all knowledge that too was a spiritual gift so so if one and and he tells us later on if one had the gift of speaking in tongues and there was no one to interpret then the one who had the tongues to be silent so this is more this whole problem of becoming arrogant over what they had and what God had given them, and so they're using it for building up the body. This idea of having faith to move mountains, this again seems to be that miraculous faith that uh, could do things under non-normal circumstances. Uh, this is spoken off in the other places as well. So, so Paul is, is, is reaching out to those people who have these very special gifts, that had become problems uh, within the church and they were causing difficulties uh, in the vision as he speaks of in other places in first Corinthians with uh, what they had verse three, he moves on to further uh, gifts. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body uh, to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. 
if I possess, if I give my all I possess to the poor. Paul does not mention in 1 Corinthians 12 this gift of, of sacrificial giving, but he does in first, uh, excuse me, he does in Romans 12 mentions that a spiritual gift. And so Paul brings this up here that if someone had that ability not to give the tithe, that's God's already, uh, but to, to sacrificially give all that he has to feed the poor, to give to charitable organizations, but he does it not out of love, but out of some sense of pride and arrogance. He said it's absolutely useless. Now, it may be beneficial to those who receive it, but it's not beneficial to the giver, the person himself in relationship to God. Then the other thing that he mentions here is the ability to totally sacrifice, even to the sacrifice of his body. And we know there were many martyrs in the first century. Uh, we already have by this point in time, uh, James, the brother of John, who was who was uh, killed because of his faith. And there would be many others in, in that particular century and the centuries that followed. But Paul says, whoever it is, if he is not doing that out of relationship to God, out of love, and a relationship for others and sharing the gospel, then the whole sacrificial concept is totally useless in relationship to his spirituality and relationship to God. So all of these things that uh, he is saying here, all these spiritual gifts, he uses three, three verses to set us up for the remainder of the chapter because this is what was really causing them problems. So genuine love, if it's not there, all these uh, miraculous gifts, and even the day with us with our spiritual gifts, uh, and we may be very qualified, uh, whether it's to teach or to preach or to serve the poor or whatever area it happens to be. If it's not done out of true love for God and true love for other people, it's a useless gift uh, as far as God is concerned. So with this setup of verse uh, verses one to three, he starts off with acts of love in, ver in, chap in verse four. Acts now, not emotions, not sentiment. And not things that we think, not things that we believe, but these are going to be acts of love and how we carry it out in our in our lifestyle on an everyday basis. And so he, he begins here in verse four. Love is patient. Love is kind. Now, Paul is going to do positive and negatives in these next several verses. These are the is verses here. Love is patient and love is kind. Patience, that long suffering, that ability to to wait on people, that ability to wait on God, uh, that uh, ability to hold our tongue and hold our uh, emotions and hold our actions uh, and wait on God. Uh, that idea of patience is love induced. It's it's motivated by love. And. And again, let me say, these are behaviors. This is lifestyle behaviors that Paul is talking about here in relationship to these Corinthians and, of course, to us. Then, it, then the next section, it does not envy. I've already mentioned that pride and arrogance is one of the, one of the main problems here in Corinth. And for all of us, uh, envy is that desire to have what someone else has, even to the point of hating and disliking and causing animosity. So were they arguing about who had the greater gift here? Seemingly so. And so this, this pride, this arrogance. And so Paul says true love does not envy what the other person has or what the other person's abilities are or what the other person looks like or how important the other person is. It just does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Remember he mentioned the, the gift about sacrificial giving or sacrificial living. Remember when Jesus was going into the temple and he watched all the, the rich people throwing in their, all their monies and to the treasury, and this widow came along and threw in with a little copper coin. And Jesus said she gave more than all of the rest of them, and the, the apostles were shocked. 
Well, lady, she hardly gave anything, but she gave from the right motive. She gave from all that she had. And so Paul brings this up, that same idea up here. Love does not boast about what we have or what we give or what we can do. It is not proud of who we are, where we live, what kind of car we drive, how we look in other people's eyes. That is a wrong motive for us. Uh, for love, it, it does not boast. 5A, it does not dishonor others. Again, we don't put ourselves above others and neither do we try to put others down as a stepping stone for our own, uh, for our own uh, worth, our own projects, our own uh, need. So it does not put others down. Or dishonor others. We will not. We will not do anything that bring might bring dishonor to somebody else, or either bring dishonor to ourselves. So we all have to work, uh, live circumspectly, looking at ourselves on a daily basis to see that we're in the right uh, relationship with God, and that we're in the right relationship with others. Remember, there's. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that there's two kinds of love: love for God. Love for one another. Those are the two great commandments. And this keeps appearing over and over in, in these lessons, doesn't it? Then verse 5D, it is not self-seeking. We have the interests of others, not ourselves. That's hard to do in this uh, fallen human nature, isn't it? Uh, we like to put ourselves first, always, in all things. And Paul says here, love, real love does not seek glorification for ourselves. 5C, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Anger. Be angry and sin not. That's difficult for us too, isn't it? But it's not easily angered. We are back early. We're talking about it's patient. Uh, we are patient and we hold our anger. We hold our tongue. We hold our tempers. And uh, we're quick to forgive. Uh, we don't. Uh, we do not hold grudges. We are not supposed to uh, let our anger even go to bed with us. We're supposed to be quick to forgive and quick to move on uh, to other portions of our lives. Verse six: Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in good or in truth. It does not delight. Ooh, they, I, they finally got what they coming to them. Isn't that great? And that's a lot of times how we think as Christians. Uh, somebody who did us uh, harm, uh, even somebody who really did evil things to us, Paul is saying here, real love uh, does not delight in them finally getting what is coming to them. Uh, again, this is a hard concept for us as Christians. Because we think the evil person, the person who did us harm, the person who did us wrong, whether it was on the job or in school or in our home or, or wherever we go, uh, even cutting in line in front of us in the grocery store or in an amusement park, that angers us to no end. And Paul says, real love for others does not delight in them being thrown out of the park. Now, the next several verses, our lesson writer is entitled, Without Exception. And here's where we have these always verses. It, love, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Always, each and every time, each and every event. Boy, that's getting hard for us, isn't it, uh, in our fallen human nature. But a redeemed uh, nature here. Remember that. Four ways of loving a person and how we treat others. We've already looked at the golden rule. Remember that? Wasn't that last week? Do unto others as you had them do unto you. And so Paul puts this in very uh, specific terms here. Always, it always treats others 
above ourselves. Verse 8. Verse 8 and 9 and 10 deals with what's going to take place when these miraculous gifts cease. What happens when we can't speak in miraculous tongues? We can't do miraculous things. We can't have that inviting, not living, but that, that spirit who gives us these miraculous. What happens then? And Paul tries to answer that in these next several verses. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. So for these Corinthians, and definitely for us today, Paul says, what are you going to do when you can no longer speak in a miraculous tongue? What's going to take place when you cannot prophesy anymore? What, not only those Corinthians, but what is the church going to do? How is the church going to react? Those things are going to cease, he says, but love never ceases. It never gives up. It never runs out. Uh, sounds like a song we sing, doesn't it? It's always there. And so if we don't have this quality, this spiritual gift of love in our lives, when all these other things are gone, where are we? What are we going to stand on? What are we going to deal with uh, toward God? And what are we going to do with others? And Paul is saying those things are going to take place. They're going to stop. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. You know, there's a lot of, lot of places, most seemingly be about Paul writing, in the, in the Bible that talks about the body as a whole. And they liken the body, our human body, with the eyes and the mouth and the limbs, uh, as to the body of Christ, the church. And in those passages, Paul talks about the eye can't do what the ear can, the mouth can't do what the hand can, and vice versa. That each part has its own particular function. And so Paul is saying that basically in this, this same text here, uh, for, for we know a part. Everybody don't can't prophesy. Everybody can't speak in tongues. Everybody can't heal. Everybody can't have faith move mountains. All these things are just partial things. And each one has that part, partial gift. And even those things, Paul is saying, is going to pass away, going to stop. And again, he brings that thing back. Where will we be if we don't have love? Verse 10. But when completeness comes, what part, that part disappears or what part disappears when completeness comes. Now, there's been a lot of controversy of this over this verse, of course, through the years, that uh, it means several different things, or primarily two different things. One, uh, most of us believe that that is talking about, Paul is talking about uh, once the, the prophecies of the first century has been completed, that God is using these to begin the church. Uh, these miraculous gifts were given to substantiate the apostles and to substantiate the word that they were having. But once all these books were written and they were, they were uh, compiled together as we have in the, in the Bible and the New Testament, that all these miraculous gifts are going to end. Others believe that he's talking about when completeness comes, in other words, when Jesus comes back or when we die, we won't need these things anymore and we will be... Uh, we'd be totally with him. So those things are only partial while we're living, but we'd be complete when we die. Either one of the cases, what Paul is saying is while we are alive and we don't have love, it doesn't matter what we have. Otherwise they're useless to us. They can't keep us in God's grace. They can't keep us in relationship with others uh, with just having these miraculous gifts or even these special gifts that, the spirit gives to people uh, for the church. So he says, now we're, we're, each one of us has this in part. 11, 
When I was a child, so he illustrates, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the childish, our childhood behind me. When I was a child, we acted like a child. We were not supposed to act like an adult. We were supposed to act like children. Now, responsible children, yes, but we were still children. And children did a lot of things that uh, were childish. And if a person continued to do those childish things, say those childish uh, things, act that childish way when they become an adult, we know something's wrong with them. So Paul applies this here to the spiritual gifts and to the Corinthian church. He says, as we mature, we will not need these early things that was very necessary. And so he said, there's going to be a, a time when these things are put away. They will not be needed any longer because we know better. And so in verse 12, that's what he says. For now we are only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we will be see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Partial knowledge. These Corinthians, whatever gift they had, was still partial knowledge. Uh, they didn't have the whole, the whole concept of what we have in the New Testament. We have those history books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of what Jesus, uh, how he was born and how he lived and how he died and how he was resurrected. We have the book of Acts, that historical book of uh, how the church began and how it moved through uh, the Mediter Mediterranean area. Then we have those books uh, from Romans all the way to into Revelation uh, to give us instructions on how to put the church in order and how things were going in the first century and all of these teachings that we have in those books. So, so he says at that point in time, when they were living to the Corinthians, they were looking like in a mirror and remember they did not have glass mirrors in the first century. What they had was highly polished uh, copper or highly polished uh, one of the metals. And those were their mirrors. Uh, not like a, a embossed gla glass mirror that we have today that totally gives us full picture. And so they were in, in ways sort of cloudy, not given a full reflection. And he says, this is what these gifts are doing for us. At this point in time, we don't see things clearly, but we see them. Uh, uh, we see them, but not as clear as they will be in the future. I think today, in fact, I know today we have the full we have the full mirror before us. We have the full gospel. We don't need any new teaching. We don't need someone to come along and say, "Look, I have a straight line from from God." Jesus told me last night what to tell you. I don't believe that. I will never believe that. The Bible does not teach that. And so Paul is saying that uh, once that. New Testament is complete, though he doesn't say New Testament. Once knowledge is complete, we have everything that we need. To know how to live, how to reach out to the lost, and how to bring them through a knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he says, this partial is going to pass away. And to those people, he's saying, what you're fighting about so greatly here in Corinth, in a few years is going to be gone. And if you don't have love, then you will have nothing left. 13 in our last, last verse. And now these remain faith, hope, and love. And the grace of these is love. These three. Faith, hope, and love. And faith is more than that. I believe in Jesus. Faith is that abiding trust of what we have in the New Testament that tells us about God. It is that daily 
relationship with Jesus that doesn't matter what takes place, how much tragedy, how much joy, how much blessings come, we're still going to be firm in our trust in him. Hope. It says in another place, hope that is fulfilled is not hope. Hope that we see is not hope. Hope is that we, we normally explain hope as that we're the end of the rope. And there's nowhere else to go. So we hold on. Hoping that thing will, things will get better. That's what keeps us looking for tomorrow and the next day. That's what keeps us looking for Jesus to come today or tomorrow. And the sight of, again, like faith, in the sight of tragedy or in the sight of great blessings, hope is what uh, we look forward to tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Because once hope is fulfilled, it's not hope anymore. It's reality. And then the last word, and Paul puts this as the premier word of the three, love. Because faith without love, hope without love, is absolutely useless. So the greatest of all these gifts, the greatest of all the, the relationships we have, is the relationship of love. And remember, love here is not the emotional jargon. It's not the Valentine uh, roses and cards and sweet tarts and all those things that we talk about so much. Love is an action. Love is at the heart of who we are in relationship to God. From God's perspective, all of our efforts, all the things that we try to accomplish, all the all the prayers that we make, all the Bible reading we do, all the service we do, if that is not done out of love for God, love for Jesus, love for others, it is absolutely useless. So this morning, as we close this lesson, the greatest of these will always be love. Thank you, God, for Jesus for Paul, who has given us these instructions, and for your spirit, who has saved and provided for us your word throughout the ages. In Jesus' name, amen.